Uh, so I think we can get started. Um, Daniela um, already did it, but I'll do it verbally. Um, thank you all for joining this session. Um, this is part of an arts, culture, and creative economies track um, at the SOCAP conference. And we're thrilled that you have this at your conference and that we have the people participating here to listen to the stories that we're going to hear today. Uh, this particular session in that track is artists as the essential healers of truth and reconciliation work. There's been a lot of racial turmoil and discussion and protest and growth um, happening this summer, but there always has been really. Uh, and there's been work that's been going on for years. And in particular, there's um, work, uh, truth, racial healing and transformation work that the Kellogg Foundation uh, funded a, a few years ago. And both Jerry and Liz are participants in that cohort. And so they've been doing this work for um, two or three years. And we're going to hear from them about what that's meant in communities that they're working in, uh, the differences in the communities, the similarities, why arts are central and why it's important to really recognize the historical context of any community that you're in, whether you're living in it or investing in it. Uh, so um, I have Jerry Hawkins and he's the executive director of the Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation um, organization and Liz Medicine Crow, who's a president and CEO of First Alaskans Institute and who I have the privilege of really being a colleague to and I'm inspired by her and my work in Alaska, um, as many are. And so I, I'm hoping that uh, this will be a conversation by being part of a cohort. Uh, Liz and Jerry have really interacted with each other quite a bit. So uh, they are going to also have conversation with each other. Um, and I'd like you to post questions in the chat and then at the end, we'll try to go back and um, give you an opportunity. Uh, but it should be a pretty free flowing conversation. Um, but just to be a little formal in the beginning to set out some structure, I wonder, um, I'll call on Jerry first, if you would just talk about um, the project itself, the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, just so we can kind of ground people in what started the journey that both of you are on. And then I'll turn it over to Liz to do the same. So Jerry. Yeah, uh, Lago and I should be uh, introducing this work. She's been part of uh, a lot of it longer than I have, but um, I can definitely talk about um, my involvement from the TRHT perspective. Um, just really gives um, TRHT um, as an initiative is um, based on um, the work um, that uh, has happened all around the world uh, under TRCs, which are true. Um, and reconciliation commissions. Um, and they happen usually when um, a country and uh, the leadership wants to, uh, you know, spend under a, um, an ethnic conflict or civil war or um, harm that has been done to uh, the indigenous population of a country. Um, we, we know uh, very, um, very particularly the uh, that happen in Canada and Africa um, and the local TRHT, uh, particularly the 14 cities and, and the 13 cities in the state of Alaska that are um, part of racial healing and transformation um, are attempting to do that work here uh, in the United States, right? Another settler colony um, that is on land and was built by stolen people. So uh, we have uh, never grappled with um, and, you know, from the TRC perspective, it is um, our opportunity to do that in a very local and a very hyper-local sense. Um, you know, Alaska is uh, statewide, so it's a different hyper-local, you know, uh, but uh, we, we're able to do that. And, and I think the, the other really important thing is that we're able to focus, um, laser focus on our communities and into, um, you know, the history um, from indigenous times to present, and also for our community create a vision um, for ending um, racism very locally and also partnering with our TRHT communities to think about that on a national perspective. Um, and this global perspective this is a, a global system of, of anti-racism work, so. Thank you, Jerry, that's great. And I'll turn it over to Liz and maybe you can talk about, I guess you you have been with this project longer. Um, and I think that Jerry is referring to some of the um, kind of sessions they had in, whether it was in um, South Africa or in Canada and really kind of truth and healing sessions. Um, 
um, that really dealt with with underlying the same underlying issue of kind of power and a community that was there and how to get through that. Um, but anyway, and then I'll turn it over to Liz to talk about your experience and maybe introduce a little bit about Alaska. Uh, thank you so much, Alex, um, for the invitation and to my brother, Jerry, this is like an action packed day for him and I, because we were doing another presentation earlier together. Um, and, you know, I really just, um, I just really want to go back in time a little bit for us here in Alaska. I'm, uh, my name is Lagunai. I am Haida and Tlingat. I am um, from Kihkwan, the village that never sleeps. If you look on the map, Southeast Alaska, and we're right about there. And um, we're in the heart of Southeast Ani. And, um, and also, I just want to acknowledge the virtual space um, that we are in, this unceded indigenous territory of virtual space. Um, when we think about those land acknowledgements, we also need to think about the virtual space that we are occupying as we come together. And so I just recognize that, um, that ancestral pull, that ancestral territory and the, the territory of our native peoples. And, and taking it back for us in Alaska, you know, this is intergenerational work. Um, truth, racial healing and transformation as an endeavor is the most recent manifestation of what our ancestors have been fighting for for the last couple hundred years. And um, for us taking leadership from our community, from our elders, from our people, um, as they continue to try to have people hear and see them for what has happened. And, <clears throat> you know, our people were calling out over the last 13 years through our racial equity dialogues um, that centered healing and, um, and policy shifting. Um, they called out for, um, at the time, the common, common language was truth and reconciliation. Well, reconciliation is a false narrative because in order to reconcile, we would have had to have started with good relationships, but that's not the history of this country. That's not the history of Alaska. That's not the history of Texas. Um, both Jerry and I come from states who are outsized in their, um, their uh, thirst for being the biggest. Um, and, uh, and, and the issues of race and racism um, are also part of that equation for both of our states. And um, for Alaska, uh, about 13 years ago, we hosted dialogues asking our Native people, because it was the 50 years of statehood for the state of Alaska, the government of Alaska, the state government. And we would travel around the state to ask our Native people, is this, you know, what are your perspectives on statehood? And they said, racism, bigotry, discrimination are still alive and well here. And we need to talk about it. We need to do something about it. Um, and so we began this, this work of, of racial healing and racial justice. Um, and again, now manifested as truth, racial healing and transformation, which doesn't include the language of false narrative, but does include the language of what we want to see as an outcome of creating spaces for truth telling, of righting wrongs, of intergenerational healing, and then transforming systems so that they actually can support an equitable space for our humanity to prosper once again. So that's how we came into the work. Um, and it's been awesome to do it with people like Jerry and others around the country who are in this work. But also there are so many others who are doing it. They may have a different name for it, but they're seeking justice. And we can't have justice without healing and we can't have healing without truth. And so that's the focus of the work. So I'll finish to Shawa. Thank you for that. I think that with this audience, and we just love that you're here um, to think about this, if we're investing in communities, as I am, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't actually introduce myself, I'm um, in charge of programs and grants at a family foundation in Alaska, and we're really place-based and one of the largest, we are the largest foundation in Alaska, so we also invest in communities. And I think that 
we've seen in uh, definitely in recent time that if you don't address sort of what's happening in the place and what needs to be healed and what how to move forward or including the people to move forward um it's just simmering there and it's ready to go um because people do want um you know justice and i think uh and i'll just share i always do it's one of my favorite quotes um from the writings of martin luther king and he said i went to law school so i really think about justice a lot and uh, he said that um justice is the next of love and it's only applied when love has failed and so I think that if we remember that justice in itself is a part of it but if we can get in front of that and actually really look at people and really connect with people then we don't need justice then there's not something to seek but in the absence uh, we need to go for both um, and, I, and what I'd like to do is hear from um, Jerry or Liz how have you engaged communities uh, and I know you have several different projects, um, both of you, and maybe I'll just um, go back and forth and I'll just start with Jerry. You know, how have you engaged people in communities to kind of hear what, what they have to say kind of um, about the past, about recognizing now, and then maybe we can talk later about how we're imagining a new future. But if you talk about kind of the, just how it began. She has um, a, a lot of guiding principles the first guy the principle is that there must be a accurate and uh, complete and very expansive uh, retelling and reaccounting um, of history. That's, that was the first step. Um, we did what uh, the TRHT guidebook calls um, a community racial history or historical analysis of policy in place race um, from indigenous times into present cross county. Um, and obviously what we found was um, stories uh, that were not even just um, not told, uh, but um, literally erased, but, uh, particularly starting with our Native communities, right? Our American communities in, in, in Dallas, uh, you know, Dallas is on the land of the Caddo and the Wichita and the Command. Um, and you will find no sign of uh, these nations existing in Dallas at all. There's no plaque, there's no, uh, you know, memorial, there's nothing, you know. Um, but there are these stories, not only from the community, but also in some of the texts that, that are saying that the same people who um, colonialized this space were uh, responsible for the genocide and removal of uh, the Caddo Nation out of Dallas, Texas. So, um, and then changed and said um, Texas Indian Troubles is one of the names of the books or Texas Savages, right? Uh, it not only them, but created narratives to um, erase. So that's the most important part for, for us, for our community is to um, start to capture and recapture and um, you know share the stories that the people have that they've been waiting for folks to talk about. The second is um, a community vision. Um, the second guiding principle says be a, a one community vision that is measurable. Um, and so uh, we wanted to find out what our community um, was thinking about. Number one is what is our, uh, our what are our histories? Um, and everybody is very different, right? We have a um, framework that tells us that these uh, immigration and migration stories are linked, right? Everyone has an immigration and migration story. Right from the beginning of time, right from the first person, uh, you know, born in Africa, right, and migrated from this place, right. Everyone has one of those stories, um, and so we to capture some stories. We also needed a shared story because we all are human. We have a human shared story when it comes to a right. Um, in, in Dallas, there's a cowboy story, right? The Dallas cowboy story. There's a state fair story. And a lot of these people uh, in our community relate to these stories. And then we have to do some imaginative work. And this is really hard sometimes for uh, some of our elders who have been um, dealing with the um, tr traumatic and very disparate effects of racism is to imagine a Dallas without racism and what it would look like and how it would feel. Um, some of their responses was that I can't imagine Dallas racism. Um, a couple of joke, uh, you know, go to the next question, you know. Uh, but we had some uh, some some of our young folks in the room who were saying, 
Uh, let's let's think about this and let's work through this. Partner with the Dallas Public Library, who has infrastructure in every community, and we held eleven sessions. Um, over two hundred folks um, who gave us input on uh, you know what Dallas would look and feel like without race. What else? Who do we need to have in the room? And then we started our work. So that was um, the two things that we needed. We knew we needed to do before we did any programming or any type of partnership to get that those two things done. Thanks, Jerry. I love that. Um, particularly the idea of that there's always been a migration and immigration story. You know that that's sort of the story of all of our land. I know I feel it in Alaska. I'm, and we'll go to Liz in a second. But um, you know I'm I'm African American and Korean, but I was born and raised here. Um, and you know, this is an ancient land and it's an Alaska native land um, in a very young little state, um, big, big state, sorry, <laughs> big state. But um, anyway, we don't want to, we always have to acknowledge how large our land is. But, um, but I know when I leave, my shared story is, you know, I went to college and everyone would say, do you feel more black or more Korean? And I would always say right now I feel Alaskan because <laughs> I don't relate to that. Um, so I think there is sort of that individual story, kind of recognizing the past, and then sort of what is that shared story? Um, anyway, I want to turn it over to Liz, and maybe you could talk um, also about how you've engaged communities. You talked about it already, um, you know, 13 years ago, sort of around state, 50-year statehood, but maybe you can elaborate a little more and share. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, we take our leadership from our people, and so when we started to think about what does TRHT Alaska look like, we went to our community and we held multiple different kinds of dialogues. And we asked, you know, what would a truth and um, racial healing process look like for Alaska? What would you want it to include? What wouldn't you want it to include? How do we go about doing this? Are people ready? You know, just kind of like really opening it up. And we held these in multiple different forums, places we got invited, conferences, um, native policy forums, you know, just within the community, all over the place where we could, so that we could get the benefit of their wisdom and experience um, to inform the way that we shape it. Um, the other group that we really worked with were, um, of course, at our own Elders and Youth Conference, where we asked them the same thing. Um, and this is, you know, 2,000 elders and youth from around Alaska getting a chance to tell us what they think these things look like, what they should, what they should reflect, um, what they should be centered on. And as always, our people give us guidance, really good advice and guidance. Um, the other is we tapped into our native healers um, and we asked them, how do we prepare a place for the truth to be shared? How do we take care of people so that we are uplifting intergenerational healing and not just causing intergenerational trauma? And then taking their advice and guidance and shaping and creating forums that are created for us, by us, about us. Um, and placing as central to that the people themselves as the receivers of the tr uh, of the testimony that's shared and what we have crafted through this process, which are tribunals. Other processes um, seek to, and we learned this from going around the, the the world, right in the in the in the formation stage of what TRHT could look like. Um, the Kellogg Foundation did some analysis of quote unquote. TRCs around the world um, to get a sense of what worked, what didn't work. And um, and really thinking about, you know, you know what, you know what we need it to be is not political because racism and the things that have happened because of it, colonization, all of these kinds of things stemming from that original sin of this country. Um, these are not political issues. These are social issues deeply rooted and seated in the very foundations of this country. Um, and so we have to figure out a different pathway. And so we centered our native values and our native people's wisdom, ancient wisdom, and figuring out processes that can support that coming together and that uplifting um, and, and really centering on the ability to listen um, and to feel and to connect that heart and mind space so that we can actually transform um, and not make it centered on what political group is in, in, is in leadership. Um, 
and, and placing that leadership within our community. So that's another way that our community leads is that they're the ones that are sitting around the table, bearing witness and receiving these testimonies. And then they're going to be part of helping to shape how do we right these wrongs? How do we address these things? How do we create curriculum to steer us in a different direction? How do we create policy to transform these things? How do we intervene in the ways that we treat one another as people within our, our social systems? And so, you know, we're really taking a lot of um, guidance from our people at the same time, um, you know, some of those things that they have said to us is we have to lead with love. And, and Alex, to your point earlier, in the absence of love is justice, right? Um, we think about equity um, not as a subtractive or like Heather McGee was saying this morning, Jerry, not as a zero sum game, but actually it's, a, it's additive and it's exponential and it's expansive. And um, it's expansive just like love is. There's no end limit to it and what it can create. Um, we have to do the work of dismantling those things that shackle us to this belief that in order for one to move forward, somebody else has to suffer. Because that's not part of that's not part of our narrative, that's not part of who we are, um, and we know that if you place native people, people of color, um, and all of those expressions of the strength of that wisdom that we bring, we will completely transform the world, not just for us but for everyone. That's beautiful. Thank you, Liz. So again. To, um, kind of speaking to the audience, um, just to kind of remind you. So again, this is the art, culture, and creative economies track, and this session is why artists are the essential healers of truth and reconciliation work. And so you're hearing a lot about what that work is, um, and I want to bring in the artist part. And I, I believe that many of us, and, and in earlier conversations um, with the panelists, um, artists are seen as decorative. Uh, and rather than, you know, really central. And um, in, in many of the projects when I came to the foundation I'm at now, there is an artist component, but it, you know, there, there are components that have to do with recognizing the past, you know, the future and imagining, um, or the present and imagining the future. And I'm wondering if maybe um, I'll go back over to Jerry, do you have any, um, could you comment on that and, and why artists are central rather than being sort of entertaining or decorative, although often it is decorative, but that's not the point. Yeah, particularly in our work in Dallas DRHT, um, art is central. Um, our first programmatic, programmatic initiative called Racial Equity Now, um, you know, we just had our graduation today and, and Liz was uh, so uh, gracious to speak um, at our event. Um, we had art um, at every session. Um, and we just didn't have artists at every session um, to, uh, you know, show their work and to have people auction off their art or, um, you know, to have uh, a singer perform a song or uh, some uh, theater, uh, you know, playwright, uh, you know, acting. We wanted to talk about the connections between the real world and their art, particularly around racial equity racial justice and racial healing, because that is our mission. Um, and not only did they do that, but they were able to, you know, talk about real things that were happening in our and, and what that means for their art. Uh, one of our artists um, who presented, Ari Brielle, did um, a series of paintings called Safe Place. And what she talked about was, um, she uh, felt that she wasn't doing enough uh, for black trans. Um, Dallas, if you all, is the epicenter of the murder of black trans, more black trans women have been murdered in Dallas than any other city. Um, she felt that she had to address um, that very important um, central topic when it comes to um, intersectionality through her, through her art. Um, we didn't just go and gawk and look at her pictures. She actually explained um, how, you know, the lack of protection to lack of vulnerability and a lack of being, it was, it was amazing to have an artist express um, the very uh, sometimes difficult social problems through her artistry. And that 
um, an artist there every time. So we had uh, Angela Faz, who was a great uh, um, screen printer and artist, uh, talk about her work and actually had our um, cohort members create their own art pieces. And so uh, we, we view it as not just uh, performance, but art as uh, practice and is like part of being human. Um, and it's also a part of how we express and, and share our voice. Uh, particularly for uh, people of color, so it's, a, it's an important part of the work. Um, it is it is not a additive it is a center, you know. Um, it is the it is the culture, the way that we talk, the way that we express ourselves, you know. Um, I mean, I have art back there. It's a, our album cover, right? But it's graphic design, um, so it's 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 part literally part of our lives. We can't it's the air we breathe. Yeah, that's great. I think um, also it's. You know, you were talking again about kind of the shared narrative or sort of a shared shared vision of community, and sometimes the art actually just captures that, and it's a way to do it. Uh, it also, um, you know, to use a word that we use a lot up here, um, there are people who are culture bearers who are kind of maintaining the culture of the past and sort of making sure that stays present. And I want to turn it over to Liz and see if you can address some, the same question about why art is central in communities or community building. Yeah, I'm going to teach. Um, I have a, a sister. Her name is Kate Charrington, and she's a Maori from Aotearoa. And when I had a chance to be in her homelands um, and we were talking about this, um, these issues, um, she said something that has always stuck with me. And she said, art is the first revolution. And it's always been a pillar for me as I think about what that responsibility means. It is a responsibility for us to cultivate and uplift and affirm and strengthen and challenge the creation of art, especially by our people, because it is it is, it is that first revolution. It is the way of us. It is a portal. It is a portal to the truth. When we can't see it ourselves, it is a portal to the sacred. When sometimes our lives lack it so much, it is a portal to connecting with our own spirit sometimes and driving us and um, seeking to share the world that we live in. Um, I am Kach Ari. I am uh, Yeh, which means I come from the Raven people clan, and my my real clan, my true clan, is Kach Ari, which is fresh water marked sockeye salmon. We literally are sockeye salmon. The expression of what that relationship is comes in the form line of our people, the art of our people expresses our identity, it makes us real. So when we think about the importance of art to what drives our ability to perpetuate ourselves, despite all that has been done, it has helped keep us alive. When so much has been focused on us to destroy everything about who we are, our art gives us something to hang on to and has carried our knowledge through that devastation. We look at our raven's tail. People credit our raven's tail with coming back through a non-native woman. And she was really important and she was a good person and she did good work. But you know who carried that on? Our ancestors carried it on because they learned how to translate that from that weaving into basketry because basketry is what the tourists collected. Basketry was the language of how to create our survival through time intergenerationally. Without our art, we would not be here. We would not know how to define ourselves or express ourselves. And so when, it, when we say it's the first revolution, it's because it's the first thing that helps us know how to stand on our feet and know how to walk on our land and know how to be in relationship to our relatives, the other animals. And so when she told that to me, it just was like a, a lightning bolt in my heart because she expressed something that I had lived. 
And Oscar Coagley, who's one of our now ancestors, a Yupik man who was um, an, a prolific artist, amazing artist, as well as philosopher and storyteller and trickster. I had the chance to um, get to know him when I was in art school. And um, I went to him just to learn from him. And um, he was giving me some guidance about my own work and where I was at and the things I was struggling with to understand about our culture, our spiritual forms, how it how it comes into form line, all those things. and. And one of the things that um, he said, learn everything you can, he said, but never forget um, something really important. And that is, you know, if all you ever do is copy what your ancestors did, you are practicing a dead art. That cut me, <laughs> that cut me deep. Because I, at the time I was struggling to just copy what my ancestors did, to, to just learn how to do their mastery. And what I, uh, what I finally understood what he said was, we're responsible for carrying this forward. We have to know it, breathe it. It has to be part of us. And then we need to add to it. It's our responsibility to challenge it and push it and grow it and express it and breathe life into it. And so when I think about how do we integrate that into the work for equity and justice, it is central and it is a pillar. And if we cannot express ourselves through art, then we're not gonna be able to seek and achieve that transformation that we, we have in the center of this work, that racial healing and moving into the building of a system that actually reflects what we want. Thank you, Liz. There's so much there that's really profound. I think for everyone right now, going through while we're in this pandemic, uh, and you know, everyone's really thinking about community and what does that mean and how do you connect. Um, I think it's a really great time for reflection and um, kind of grounding yourself in what is your community. Uh, so in a way, this is a great time to be thinking about these things. I think that people are going to be thinking about things in a fresh way. And I'm wondering if um, Jerry or Liz, you could talk about, and you touched on that, Liz, what is the way forward and how do, how do we ground ourselves in today and move forward? Because our communities do matter, whether it's the building, the gathering place, the, um, you know, the park, the whatever it is that's being funded or developed, it's a place there. It's a gathering place. It's a place for the people. And how do we actually move forward? And, and you could answer this in any way. It could be an example of a project, um, a story. It could be, a, you know, just something, you know, you're working on right now. Because I think that out of this work that you're doing, the truth, um, racial healing and transformation is a way forward. So I don't know if either of you want to um, answer that or, you know, you can talk with each other as well and ask. Answers like an eye. What are all the answers? Tell us all the answers. <laughs> um, no, I think um, because uh, and Liz put this beautifully. Uh, because our ancestors have done so much, uh, you know, we don't think of that art um, that survives and that people pick up as a, a, a way of not just only resistance but as the survival, but Folks have went through so much, and I don't, I don't think that um, we as a people understand the so much that our ancestors have been. Um, and I and I think honoring it is to finding finding it and sharing it, amplifying the stories of uh, and resistance. Um, you know, we need inspiration during those times, and I think uh, those stories are are, are inspiring. And not only that, but they, they give us a blueprint for the way forward. Um, these, none of these things are new that we're going through. You know, we had a, a pandemic 100 years ago, and our people had to get through that. How did they get through that, you know? Um, so many people don't even know the story of, of, of uh, people of color during those times, right? How did they get through these issues? Um, and so it's really um, finding um, stories of our ancestors and, and doing that as well. Um, I think another way to also think about it is um, we have to keep, like during these. Uh, I think time is over for 
um, you know, status quo type things. Um, you know, we need very bold, imaginative ideas, um, and nobody can do that better than art, uh, artists and, and art. But um, I think we have to like artists. You know, uh, we have to you know, uh, stop thinking about what is here and think about what is what is um, to come and what is not here. Uh, this world that we created, uh, or that it was created for us, that we're living in, um, we all didn't play a part in it and in, in designing it. Um, I know I didn't design the street outside my house that doesn't have a sidewalk because I right so, well, so so somebody could walk, or maybe not have a sidewalk at all, covering up the ground and the ground can't breathe. Right, so all of these things uh, that we have here are, are not even created by very equitable people. Um, and so what does the world look like where women are participating in the, the, the leadership in, in creating this, right? What does the world look like where uh, um, black people are designing cities or uh, Latinx people are designing bike lanes, right? We, we have no idea what that looks like because that hasn't happened before, but we can make it happen, you know? Um, and we can, we, can, we can do that now, we don't have to wait. Um, so I just think, you know, finding those stories in history, because I'm a historian, um, and finding the blueprints, because there's a lot of blueprints that we haven't discovered. Um, and then there's also blueprints that are being hidden from us very intentionally. Dallas is one of those places. It's a very ahistorical place. You won't find many old buildings in this in this city at all. And, and definitely not um, the stories of people who uh, lived uh, before this place was called Dallas. Um, and so there's a, uh, you know, um, a group of us um, particularly our American Indian Heritage Day. Um, Angela Foz, who is an artist, and um, some other people who are um, this Archicosta uh, Project. Um, that is the original name. Archicosta is the original name, the cattle name of the Trinity River. And we, we're trying to reclaim uh, the name, particularly for Dallas. It's a lot of different ways of moving forward. And, and the main is, is the indigenous uh, wisdom and practices and names uh, we claim in those for the places that we live in. Yeah, it just sparked an idea, just a thought in my head about um, all of that creative thinking um, that isn't being used really to design things or lead things. And we have all of these classes now, and especially in Silicon Valley on design thinking, um, you know, and, and actually trying to untrain people from just following what was before to like open and be expansive. And really there's so much design thinking that isn't being accessed um, in a lot of indigenous and um, you know communities of color. So it's interesting that that's a resource actually that isn't being utilized. Um, Liz, do you have any thoughts you want to share about that? Uh, you know, one of the things that I think about in terms of um, where we are now within the quote unquote art world is, you know, um, and it's so funny to say it because it's, it's, it seems like it's something that has been being worked on for a long time, but the notion of what it means to decolonize art and to decenter Western paradigms of what art is and who are makers of art and who gets to define what it is and who gets to set the value, um, the worthiness of it. Um, and, and as I think about that, one of the things that I'm really struck by, and this happens in so many areas of our lives, is that our Native people are called on to Thing. And they have to wear so many hats and they get so um, overwhelmed and their bandwidth so stretched. And, um, and so they're just constantly trying to chase, you know, all of these things to get them done because they just have so much work to do on behalf of our communities. And I think about that pivotal and central role for communities. I wonder about how we can actually support our artists in the same way we support others. You know, there's in Alaska, there's the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, ANSEP, which has been lauded as this really um, amazing program. Um, we need an arts equivalence, you know? We need our people to know that their push for art, uh, their centering of art in their lives and their communities is essential to our well being and it needs to be supported. I think about how we tax our artists with being also small business owners and with also being marketers, which is completely antithetical to our value system. 
um, and uh, and and to be able to have people like I see Lori Poirier here, um, you know, I see a Nami on here um, commenting, who are people who are you know walking the talk and trying to make this stuff happen, and we need to decenter the way that it has been set up now because it doesn't function that way for our people, and their art gets buried and their art gets utilized as a co-optation of their voice um, instead of the intrinsic value it has for the shifting of policy and the changing of the narrative. And that's the piece that I'm super excited about seeing how that can get supported in the work going forward. So within TRHT, for instance, in Alaska, and I've loved seeing this and learning from, from Jerry and what they're doing in Dallas, is about how you center that voice um, that leadership without then making it their responsibility to also become policy ma policy making advocates, right? Like we all have different roles and strengths and skill sets. So how can we have our artists like set forward really Im important like to our hearts and, and then have the um, policy wonks get in there and figure out what is that policy solution that they have, they have just kind of reflected for all of us through their art expression into a policy that actually is transformative within systems that would otherwise oppress them. And, um, and I think that that's not working within the system, that's creating what we want. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's both an intervention and then also a creation of something that we want. That's great. So I, I know we're getting close to our time. We have about 15 minutes. So Danielle has invited people in the chat to um, raise questions, or if you want to make a comment, um, let us know in the chat. Uh, I think that for people who are investing in communities, uh, right now, so many kind of um, projects or maybe community buildings, or it could be malls, it could be whole neighborhoods, are strapped. Everyone's having to be resilient. Businesses are being asked to close, to open, but how do you tap in really, you know, if you tap into the community and they own it, they're gonna transform it and they're gonna hold it and, and keep it moving forward. So what is it you would want funders to understand about community and investing in community? And um, that's something for you to think about. And what is it that artists need? I think that Liz started on that as well. And so maybe you two can just take a minute to, um, Think about that or if you have an answer already i'm, I'm going off script <laughs> uh, I, um, I think funders um uh an important um it's, it's, it's very important um during this time for funders to realize that that we're in as well you know um i saw uh for the first time uh some of the most uh, old and um, wide-ranging statements against racism um, that I've ever uh, read, right? And these are from not only funders, but from businesses and corporations, and, um, from from everywhere, right? Um, but holding true to those statements, the hard work. Um, take even harder work than um, what folks think they need um, the racial wealth gap, for instance, is so large um, that it's not only going to take um, federal repair, like things like reparations and 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 healthcare for everyone that is not linked to your job, but it's going to take local reparations. It's going to take uh, a, a, a reformation, right? A reformation of what we know to be true about everything. Um, and so, I think for funders uh, to really uh, start to invest in folks who are doing direct equity work on a, on a very local level, um, you know, uh, and not um, making them uh, jump through uh, rings of fire and uh, spike pits and uh, holes in order to get funds. And when they do have access to those funds, to not restrict something that the funder thinks is important. Um, I think that the people on the ground know what's important to their communities um, and to let them share uh, freely with the work that they're doing because they need you know, to do the work. Um, 
not only uh, I think we talked about this, uh, Alex. Um, there's a lot of uh, investment in the medical field, right? Um, and what we call it is R and D, right? This research and development. Uh, but that type of investment should also be done in the in the social sector, particularly with people who are doing um, work around race, racism, um, and artists, especially. There's an artist on here with us too from Dallas. His name is Daryl Ratcliffe. Um, they're talking about how artists are so underfunded um, in Dallas, even though Dallas has an arts district. Uh, Dallas has a, a district um, that used to be the Free Freedman's Town in Little Mexico, uh, that uh, supposed to be about art, but has no artists in it. Right, no artists live there. You know, get priced out. <laughs> right, these big organizations, and so um, it's really important that uh, folks are funding people on the ground. Uh, people who are um, producing art that tells uh, us what time it is and, and where we need to go, but also the people who are doing true uh, anti-racism, uh, racial equity, working in indigenous communities, uh, you know, working with, uh, you know, black indigenous people of color organizations that are led by those folks um, and just opening up the, um, the faucet, so to speak, um, and not putting those barriers in front of people. Um, you know, as an artist myself and Liz is an artist as well, I was, I was trained at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, right? One of the, the uh, what, it, what we call it, the premier institutes for art mm -hmm. uh, that has all the stolen art in it, right? I'm just thinking about the, uh, you know, all of the art that belongs to all these indigenous people that are there that I studied. I had to go and, and, and you know, draw, sketch these um, stolen pieces of art. But, but what, I, what I thought about was that as an artist, why did I have to go here to have my art validated, right? Um, for our communities, uh, art, particularly like music, um, you know, visual things is really our, our basis of survival. Uh, my ancestors literally like escaped slavery through, right? Um, used, uh, you know, uh, drawings in the ground to direct themselves north or south or, or west or east right um mm -hmm. off of these plantations and so uh i think folks don't understand the centrality of um and if we can continue to invest in artists uh particularly when artists are addressing these issues that we're dealing with like um health race and culture that we can really like um see a way forward um, I, some amazing artists out here uh, that are really doing that work. Uh, Daryl Radcliffe was here, introduced me to an artist in our community called David Jeremiah. And his work is just, it just smacks you in your face because he deals with, uh, he doesn't punch, hold any punches, right? And I think that um, is the power of art that can, can wake us up or slap us or, you know, but to, to Laguna's point is, is that lightning bolt in our heart, right? So it's really important. That's great. Um, so maybe building on that, Liz, and I also want to include a kind of expand on it a little with the question that Colin Stewart is asking about work that's been happening in his community um, in North Vancouver, uh, decolonizing the school curriculum and how do we accelerate this happening everywhere? And I was going to also ask, you know, what would we say to people? The first part of the question is, what do we want to communicate to funders um, during this time? And the second part is, what is the advice that people want to start this conversation or start this process in their community or in their project? And if you have any thoughts about that, and I'll go to Liz first and then Jerry, if you have something you want to add to that. Um, sheesh, I would say um, for funders, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have as funders, um, and this is something, you know, Jerry and I are both working in organizations that do fund, um, fund work within our communities and um, you know, one of them is to realize that uh, our communities know what's best. And if, if, if designing a partnership with a community means finding someone who's a right fit for your agenda is the process you use by which to fund into their work to, um, to get those funds out of your institution and into that community, then um, you need to take a really hard look because that's the that's the um, opposite approach to what is actually um, valuing and center centering community leadership. Mm -hmm. What is the community's priorities? You know, 
fund them instead of funding them on a one year, two year, three year cycle, make a commitment to be a good relative and fund them for 20 years. Don't chase the new hotness, Mm -hmm. build relationship and allow them to pursue and do the work that they have identified as their priorities. Um, Any other way is the same status quo that we have now and that's not getting us the results we want or aspire to or espouse. And so if you really wanna walk the talk, you gotta get the money into the hands of the people who know what's best for them and let them lead, let them decide how to spend it, where Mm -hmm. to spend it, when to spend it, what projects to create, Mm -hmm. instead of driving it through your own filter agenda, your own agenda filter. Um, And the same can go with artists, you know, Um, how can we actually fund our artists so that they can do their work You know, I heard recently about San Francisco starting to do like a monthly um, uh, monthly support mechanism for artists, you know, what what and how can we make sure that we're actually supporting artists so that they can continue to expand and deepen their work. Um, We have to figure out ways of allowing us to trust them and invest in them without it being a hierarchical built on your status selling yourself. Um, because if that's the case, so many of our most incredible artists will not be even looked at or noticed until too late. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have to figure out a decolonial structure for, for investing in our artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that also gets to how do you decolonize a curriculum? Um, because it's the same thing. Let your community lead you and push for it and don't operate at the speed of, um, of the system's comfort level because the system's doing what it's supposed to do. It's creating the results it's supposed to create. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not in, It's not invested in transformation. Um, and the only way we can make that happen is to drive it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, um, and you've really hit on something. I'm um, Jeremy Gregg in the chat was asking um, if um, either of you had been seen any more participatory grant making where donors are entrusting their funds to the people they seek to support, which is really exactly in a way what you're saying, um, you know, through a grant making lens, um, you know, let the people who you're trying to benefit make the decisions. And I also want to um, notice um, Name wrote, you know, being a good relative and having relationship based outcomes. And that's not something that we do. Um, you know, we have numbers based outcomes and the numbers aren't based on relationship um, or connection. Uh, we only have a few more minutes, and so I'm just going to um, open it up to Jerry and Liz if there's something you want to say in closing or if you want to respond to any of those comments. And I'll go back to Jerry for a couple minutes. I think that, um, you know, I'm just really honored to uh, be stewarding um, the TRC work in Dallas, um, particularly as uh, someone who is uh, native to another city. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, um, and I um, I knew as soon as I landed in Dallas that this place um, was different than the place that I grew up in, um, and that I needed to respect uh, the elders already here who are doing work by learning um, very deeply about the place in which I live. Um, I committed to that wholeheartedly. Um, and um, in Dallas, we have a project um, that we were working on with our American Indian Heritage Day folks. Um, it's called um, Articosa. And one part of the, another part of the Articosa project is, is we are all indigenous. Um, and, and, and what that meant was that, um, you know, everyone is indigenous to the place, right? Um, but we all don't respect the people who are indigenous to the place in which we live. Um, how do we create um, a respect for indi- uh, indigenous people, period, right? But also how do we create a respect for the people who are from a place um, and that that are um, responsible for um, keeping the wisdom and the knowledge of the people who are now and sharing. Uh, and so it's really in- important for us to think about new and innovative ways um, to do these old things, which are solidarity with each other, right? To, to build our common humanity, right? Uh, one of the uh, cool things that we did with that project is that um, we had uh, kids of all colors um, take pictures with these um, archives. So we are indigenous, uh, right? 
what it what it meant was that folks learned about the place in which they were from, right? That means white folks learning about Ireland or whatever, you know, uh, because when you become white, you have to get rid of cultural heritage from the place you're from, right? Um, it meant that um, you know folks who are from El Salvador started to learn more about the history, right? And then they also learn more about the people who are from here, um, which is which is ultimately what we want to do, right? We want to respect each other's culture um, and respect each other as human beings um, and break down, you know, what Kellogg and, 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 and folks like uh, Lagunai and other people created, what is this um, breaking down this hierarchy of human value um, that puts up these categories based on race and gender and class. Um, and we only do that by being in relationship with each other and learning about each other. And um, I think those are the most important things. I think if you are in a community and you don't know about that community, you have to do that work. That is personal work, but it is also uh, you know, community. So that's that's my um, my 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 skill. Do that work for yourself. And that's beautiful um, because it isn't about these other indigenous people. It's really about all of us being recognized for our own indigenous nature, past, and so that we can be present. I think that's great. That's sort of what takes away everyone's individuality when you're part of a system and hierarchy. Um, I'm going to give Liz the last word, but first I also want to thank Yerbas uh, Buena Center for the Arts for putting this whole track together. There's so much work going on behind the scenes. I uh, really appreciate all of you. Uh, in the chat, they also mention, um, um, you know, anyway, specifically um, Deborah, Penelope, Daniela, and Deborah mentioned, you know, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts announced an investment of 250,000 in artist-driven given circles. So with that community having the artists actually making all the decisions, which I think in the first meeting, people were a little bewildered. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> we get to do whatever we want. And, and so it'll be exciting to see. And I think somebody, um, Doug Schaefer also shared the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking for people to take a look. Um, anyway, so Liz, I'm going to give you the um, final word. Um, it's an honor to host you two and to moderate and, and have you share your story. So I turn it over to Liz. Thanks, Chishawa. I was thinking about um, two ways that I think would be transformational. Um, one is to um, make access to language learning um, as Indigenous people, as Native peoples of this country, make language learning and cultural learnings, the, uh, the practice of doing our cultural work, our artwork, um, make those free and accessible through every educational system that we have, including the university systems. Our language and our cultures are our birthright. They were taken from us. They need to be given back. And the way that you do that is to make it accessible to everyone and allow them to be able to tap into it. Because when you invest at that level, of learning all the way through our, our lives um, from birth to ancestor, we are going to create a regenerative impact that is intergenerational and that is actually going to make our artwork and our expression that much more powerful. And so I think that that is one place to definitely start. And as we think about how we can continue to uplift our artists um, to create um, at, uh, that expectation that um, their best um, and and their um, continued perseverance despite everything is absolutely necessary, but not at the expense of their ability to also um, participate in the healing that they're helping bring to others through their work. Um, so we need to be able to also create space for our artists to heal. That intergenerational healing is incredibly important um, and to invest in them, um, taking that time to do that, but also to then offer the challenge um, of support so that they can then drive their art even further beyond anything that we can even comprehend. Um, and that's what I'm really excited about because as we as we seek to create that space, it also helps us um, broaden out what we think about in this expansive territory of what equity will truly mean for us. So, Manish Chishawa for inviting me and giving me a chance to be with both Alex and Jerry, who are two of my favorite people. So finish to yourself. Thank you both. That was really wonderful. And I hope people are really inspired. You know, your personal story and your personal journey is part of your work. It's not separate. And it's not going to be really great work unless it really connects. So anyway, thank you, everybody. And, and we'll close out this session. <laughs>